This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. I want to talk about Bishop Richard Williamson of the Society of St. Pius X. Someone who reads our website recently encountered Bishop Williamson at a Society of St. Pius X Mass location. This individual asked Williamson if he believes in invincible ignorance. In other words, that souls who are not Catholic, who are, quote, invincibly ignorant of the Catholic faith, can be saved. Williamson responded by saying, essentially, that he certainly does. This individual then replied to Bishop Williamson and said, How do you reconcile that belief in, quote, invincible ignorance with Pope Eugene IV's dogmatic definition in the Bull Cantate Domino that all the Jews, pagans, heretics, schismatics go to the fires of hell and cannot be saved unless they are joined to the Catholic Church before the end of their lives? Williamson responded by saying essentially that one must, quote, understand the dogmatic text of Pope Eugene IV. And I want to talk about this as well as some other things that Bishop Williamson has said and believes. The statement that one, quote, must understand a dogmatic proclamation is a typical explanation of modernists. Vatican I declared that dogmas are to be understood as Holy Mother Church has once declared, and that there must never be a recession, in other words, a going away from, that meaning under the specious name of a, quote, deeper understanding. And so heretics, in order to depart from the defined truth, frequently say that one, quote, must understand those dogmatic texts. And in the process, their conclusion winds up being totally at odds with what the text itself says. As we can see in this case, Williamson's conclusion is that souls can be saved who are not Catholic, which is exactly the opposite of what the text declares. And so, under the specious name of deeper understanding, he winds up denying the defined truth. And that is exactly what Vatican I condemns that is, modernism. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise that he believes this, for we've pointed out quite clearly in our books and on our website that the Society of St. Pius X priests all believe that souls can be saved in any religion. It's published in their best-selling books, the books of Archbishop Lefebvre and others, Against the Heresies, Open Letter to Confuse Catholics, Time Bombs of the Second Vatican Council, etc., that souls can be saved in non-Catholic religions, and they even name them, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, etc. And so they blatantly deny the Church's dogmatic teaching that there's no salvation outside the Church. They turn it into a meaningless formula. And so in this encounter, we see again how modernist heretics such as Williamson have no cogent response to the pure dogmatic truth. Their only recourse is to engage in the typical argumentation of modernists, which departs from texts of the highest authority in the Catholic Church. And contrary to what he says, the Church has not always taught that souls who are not Catholic, but, quote, invincibly ignorant, can be saved. This is addressed in our book. The Church, in fact, has never taught this, but this is an erroneous and heretical development of later centuries. Now, in addition to mentioning that recent encounter, which we discussed on our website, and you can read about it in our e-exchanges section, I wanted to talk about some of the other things that Bishop Williamson has said, which are truly outrageous. And we've covered them in our material, but it's easy for people to forget them and just how bad they are. I want to note that we like some of the things that Bishop Williamson has said on secular matters, and we obviously desire his conversion to the Catholic faith, but the truth must be told about his theological positions and beliefs so that people do not come away with a false impression that this is a man of Catholic truth, when in fact he is not. Of course, he belongs to the Society of St. Pius X, an independent group which professes to be Catholic but recognizes Benedict XVI as the Pope. Their position is fundamentally illogical and unfortunately obstinately schismatic. As we point out in our section on the Society of St. Pius X on our website, schism is the refusal of communion with the Roman Pontiff or with true Catholics. 
since the Society of St. Pius X obstinately and tenaciously recognizes Benedict XVI as the Pope, despite all of the evidence that he's a manifest heretic who can't be the Pope, they have no excuse at this point in time for continuing to remain independent in operation from his, quote, hierarchy. One could understand that at the beginning of the Vatican II apostasy, they were resisting it and thus independent in some measure for some time. But after decades, when all of the issues have been thoroughly evaluated and the facts necessary to arrive at a conclusion on these matters apparent and available, there is no excuse for them to regard Benedict XVI and his bishops as Catholics, yet not be in union with them. As St. Jerome says in his commentaries on the epistle to Titus, schism separates one from the church on account of disagreement with the bishop. End quote. And as St. Ignatius of Antioch in his letter to the Trallians says, anyone who acts without the bishop and the presbytery and the deacons does not have a clean conscience. End quote. The point here is not that one could never have a disagreement with the bishop, but to obstinately operate outside of his communion while you simultaneously recognize him as the legitimate occupier of the office is definitely schismatic. And since they've persisted in this position for decades, there is no excuse for them. And this is aggravated by the fact that they actually have the audacity, despite all the evidence, to condemn those who correctly and logically come to the position that Benedict XVI and his bishops are not Catholics and therefore hold no authority. In other words, the set of Acontists. And so while condemning the set of Acontists and saying, you must be with anti-Pope Benedict XVI, who believes in nothing, they simultaneously do not operate under his hierarchy. It's amazingly hypocritical and outrageous, especially when we consider how long it has perdured. But you can read more about that and their denial of the salvation dogma on our website, and Bishop Williamson is a party to all of these theological and spiritual crimes. But what I want to talk about in this particular video, and I'm running out of time, are some of the other things that Williamson has said which are truly outrageous. In an interview a few years back, and this is covered in our article about Williamson on our website, for the full quotes, go there, he was asked about John Paul II, and he talks about how John Paul II centered so much on the human person, and how he believed in man, and he goes on to say, quote, I think John Paul II was sincere. I think he was a good man, but he was just deeply mistaken. And I think Pope Benedict XVI is the same kind of man. I believe he's decent and sincere, but deeply mistaken. End quote. This is totally evil. He says that John Paul II, who committed innumerable acts of heresy and apostasy, who prayed with animus, who engaged in condemned interreligious prayer meetings, who kissed the Koran, who bowed his head and prayed with the Jews for the coming of their, quote, Messiah, who presided at, quote, masses with topless women, and on and on and on, that he was a good man, and he's well aware of many of his acts of outrageous apostasy. This shows that Williamson is not someone who is simply close to the truth, but mired in a heresy he needs to get out of. He is a man who believes in nothing. Anyone who can say this about John Paul II, while being familiar with what he was involved with, has no faith. To say that he was good is to equate that which is of Christ, that which is good, with that which is of Antichrist, with that which is immoral, with that which repudiated tradition, with that which engaged in condemned acts, with that which completely disregarded and trampled upon the dogmatic teaching of the popes. It is satanic to equate those, and to say that someone who knowingly engaged in all of this activity was good. In fact, even if we look at John Paul II, and we prescind from all of his theological crimes, and we ignore all of his heretical utterances, his acts of apostasy, his statements of blasphemy, and we just look at him from a moral perspective, about how well he quote, disciplined the Vatican II Church, he presided over the worst priestly sex scandal that the Church has ever known. He didn't excommunicate any, quote, pro-abortion politicians. So even if we exclude many of the doctrinal issues and all of these acts 
he was involved with. The guy was totally evil just on that front. And so Williamson, being familiar with a lot of this, says he was a good man. This is dark, and this demonstrates that beneath their cassocks and their traditional masses, there is no faith, it is meaningless, it's a charade from the standpoint of believing in any kind of necessity to Christ and his dogmas and his truth. And he says the same thing about Antipope Benedict XVI. While admitting that these men engage in a revolution against Christ's dogmas. And I'm going to talk about some of the other outrageous and completely illogical statements Williamson makes, while at the same time carrying himself with a disgusting level of pseudo-intellectual pomposity. I will talk about more of that in part two. This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. This is part two of the video, Bishop Richard Williamson, A Theological Mess. In part one, I discussed how Bishop Williamson unfortunately denies the dogma outside the church there is no salvation. He believes that the clear dogmatic pronouncements must be explained away by, quote, understanding them, and that understanding leaves him with a conclusion that there is salvation for people who are not Catholic, and in fact in any religion, as their books say. We also discussed the totally illogical and unfortunately obstinately schismatic position of the Society of St. Pius X vis-a-vis -vis Benedict XVI and his, quote, hierarchy, in other words, the Vatican II sect, and how they regard them as the legitimate occupants of Catholic seats of authority, while at the same time obstinately operating independent of them, and denouncing people who correctly and logically point out that they have no authority, such as the set of contests. I also covered how Bishop Williamson amazingly said that John Paul II was a, quote, good man in an interview a few years back, despite knowing about many of John Paul II's scandalous, heretical, outrageous, and blasphemous statements and actions. Now, returning to that point, he not only said that John Paul II was a, quote, good man, he said that he believes Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, who, like John Paul II, has engaged in innumerable acts of heresy and statements that are contrary to defined Catholic truth, he believes he's in good faith, too. At the same time, in this interview, he admits that Rahner and Ratzinger were engaged in, quote, an absolute revolution. Quoting from this interview in the article on our website, he points out how their goal was to reorient things toward man and bring in a new religion, and that they wanted to, quote, rewrite, to empty out all the bottles, all the dogmas of their old content and refill the dogmas with brand new content that will be acceptable to modern man and that new content is coherently a system that starts with man, centers on man, and finishes with man. And he goes on, that is briefly the new religion. He says, is Cardinal Ratzinger conscious of all this? I believe he's in good faith. End quote. So he admits they're engaging in a revolution to empty the dogmas of their traditional content. A revolution against Christ, against the gospel. But you can do all that and even lead the charge of it and be in good faith. This is satanic. If Benedict XVI and John Paul II were in good faith, then that means that there can be universal salvation. Because if people who are extremely familiar with Catholic teaching and even rose to, quote, high-ranking positions of authority in what people think is the Catholic Church, if they can then, quote, carry on an absolute revolution against the traditional dogmas, and empty them of their content, and they can be in good faith, and therefore if they're in good faith they can be saved, then anybody could be in good faith, because that is as culpable as one can be. If you are thoroughly educated in the true faith, and then you attack the dogmas, and you do so by leading millions of others into the same denial of those dogmas, there is no one who is more culpable. In other words, there's no excuse for those individuals, and so if they can be saved, then anybody can be saved. 
And that's why these individuals, even though they deny it, it's true, they believe in universal salvation. That's the logical result of their heretical denial of the necessity of adhering to Catholic truth to be in a good state, the state of grace, and be saved. And so again, I want to emphasize how dark this is. Beneath the cassocks and the chanting and the Latin, this is dark. This is a denial of Christ. This is empty. It's a charade. I also want to talk about how Williamson, in confronting the many contradictions that arise in adhering to his false position on the Vatican II Church, he, of course, comes up against the problem of canonizations. Canonizations are traditionally held to be infallible because they pertain to the infallibility of the Church and the infallibility of universal laws of the Church. And, and so canonizations, for those and other reasons, are infallible. But in addressing this in a letter of December 6, 2002, which is quoted in this article, he says, quote, Indeed, before Vatican II, Catholic theologians agreed that canonizations, not beatifications of saints, were virtually infallible. But since Vatican II, there has followed such a flood of canonizations under John Paul II that the whole process of canonizing has lost, together with its solemnity, any likelihood of infallibility. Indeed, how can John Paul II intend to do anything infallible, or therefore do it, when he so often acts and talks, for instance, about living tradition, as though truth can change. End quote. This is totally illogical and heretical. He simply denies that canonizations are infallible anymore. Now, that's not logical. If you have a valid pope before Vatican II, and canonizations are infallible, as he says, and then they claim that John Paul II was a valid pope after Vatican II, the logical conclusion is that canonizations are still infallible if you regard him as the Pope, unless you can show a clear defect in the way that the canonizations are being done, not in the number of the, quote, canonizations that are being declared. He doesn't even attempt to do that because he can't. For John Paul II uses the same solemn formula that they used before Vatican II, and so he simply denies that they're infallible anymore on the basis that there's been, quote, such a flood of canonizations. That is ridiculous. Any logical person can see that that means that the church is no longer infallible, that something has changed here. And so a logical person would conclude that the defect is with the man attempting to do the canonization, John Paul II, because he's not a pope. He also says something that's heretical. He says that how can John Paul II intend to do anything infallible and therefore do it when he so often talks and acts about living tradition? In other words, because he doesn't really believe in the concept of tradition that is handed down, he therefore cannot do anything that is infallible. That is heretical and absurd. It means that a pope can pronounce something in a manner that is infallible, and it will not be infallible because of what's going on in his mind. That is simply a denial of the protection that Christ gave to popes when they utilize the fullness of the teaching power. It is a denial of Vatican I. It is completely heretical nonsense because it takes the unchanging principle out of the office itself and subjects it to the mind of a man. No, the principles are unchanging. A true pope, when he exercises his authority in certain ways, is infallible, period. If you have a man who purports to be a pope and is making clear errors in, quote, canonizations, then you don't have a pope. You can't conclude that he is a pope, but the act might not be infallible because he could have strange ideas in his head. That is to subject unchanging, infallible Catholic principles to the various views of different men. Now, it doesn't matter what a pope is thinking. If he is, in fact, a pope, he is infallible when he does certain things. But the problem here is that John Paul II was not a pope, and that's why, in defending that false position, they fall into all kinds of other heresies, illogical arguments, and modernistic ideas. The next outrageous statement I want to talk about comes in the same interview I referenced earlier. 
Shortly after Benedict XVI's, quote, election, Williamson was asked about it, and he said, quote, To tell you the honest truth, I don't expect a great deal from Rome as it stands. They are too far gone in the, quote, new religion, and the new religion is too radically different and distant from the true religion. Rome is Rome, though, and I do believe there the popes are, and there are the cardinals, and that is where the official structure of the church is to be found, end quote. As I said in my article a while back, this is theological puke. It's completely ridiculous. Williamson says that the Vatican II religion is a new religion. That means that it's not the Catholic religion. Yet, he says that these men who lead this religion, and therefore are leaders of a false non-Catholic new religion, they are the representatives of the Catholic Church, the legitimate hierarchy of the Catholic Church. That means that the Catholic Church and the Catholic religion has been equated with a new false religion. It's very simple. If they are part of a new religion, that means they don't have the Catholic faith. And it's a dogma that if you don't have the faith, you're outside the church. You cannot be in the same communion. You cannot be in the same body with those who do not share the same faith. And yet this man constantly insults others, talks about how, quote, Feniite and Sedevacantus minds shut down as if they're not thinking correctly when he's guilty of outrageous statement after modernist heresy after completely illogical absurdity. This is pseudo-intellectual pride and spiritual blindness in action to an outrageously high degree. Despite Williamson's pretension to sound thinking, traditional principles, and theological expertise, we can see that the reality is just the opposite.